happily laughing like a hyena that's just heard a good one from another hyena. <laughs> Noted for being the one who is not a jailbird, nor obscenely rich in Britain's most celebrated double act, he is quite capable of going it alone and showing the world that he is a human being virtually in his own right. He's an actor, comedian, tragedian, presenter, lover and father of countless children. But most of all, he is tapping his feet angrily and waiting for this ruddy, embarrassing introduction to kindly leave the stage. Please welcome that powerhouse of extraordinary abilities, Mr. Hugh Lloyd. Thank you for joining us, Well, Hugh. that's very good of you to have me. Yes. <laughs> now, you're, at the moment, you're enfooling us all as Bertie Wooster on uh, Jeeves and Wooster. Now, it's absolutely <laughs> first class. Do you enjoy playing that kind of chat, the sort of upper-class twit sort of thing? Um, yeah, well, it's, yeah, yeah, it's good fun. It is good fun. Um, I mean, it's very good fun being in something as big as that because we had, you know, we had canvas chairs with our names on the back. I mean, you know, that's serious, isn't it? Um, but it was, uh, it was a good, it was kind of... I mean, an extraordinarily pampered lifestyle you're getting into, and there were there were times when it was, you know, you did think this is when Stephen we'd be doing a scene, and Stephen would suddenly be, uh, you know, suddenly take my shoes off in the middle of it. Get out of it! Uh, it, it was, um, uh, it's an extraordinary life they led. It's been good fun to do. Yeah. Were you a big fan of Woodhouse originally? Did you like? Yeah, a huge fan. Yeah, I mean, I, I was mostly into the. Uh, it was mostly the the Blandings Castle novels. I came to Jeeves and Worcester pretty late, um, but I. Um, I've always been a huge fan, yeah. I mean, he's a funny man. I was always a Smith man myself. But did you, did you have a problem, I mean, was it, well, Smith the books, I mean, I was not, not, not yeah, Smith yeah, the person, yeah. who there are far too many of, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, but was it difficult for you coming to play a part that is so well known? I mean, everyone, most people, anyway, have read a Woodhouse book or they've seen the Dennis Price, Ian Carmichael series. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Ian Carmichael one was a long time ago, of course. I mean, no disrespect to Ian, but it was, you know. It was a, and, uh, um, but, uh, so I don't know how many people, you know, remember that in detail. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was a bit nervy because the, the the people who love Woodhouse are a lot of them are a bit mad actually you know it's a it's a religion for a lot of people and uh, they really do live it you know and if you don't come up to to scratch they let you know. You know. The, now some people have said that perhaps you not so much you actually Stephen Fry is a bit too young to play the part. Is it is there any base in that? I mean, are there ages ever given in the books? They're not. Well, no. I think I, th I think Bertie's always thought to be sort of in his mid twenties. Ha ha. And, uh, and so if anything, you're way past it. Oh, you, way, yeah. way past it. Yeah. Um, and 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 Jeeves, I think he's never never described apart from he's a he's a tall, darkish sort of Johnny. That's all it says. Um, <laughs> but I mean, Steve, Stephen's a very odd man, really, because he he was born at the age of about 45, <laughs> and uh, and then has got sort of slightly younger as time has gone by. He's now about 25. He is think. regressing, isn't he? He's he bought is. himself a motorbike. And Motorbikes, leather jackets, jeans, jeans. Jonathan, and he'll be at the, oh yes, I've heard. Yeah. And he'll be getting some Lego soon as uh, well. Well, it won't be right? long. No, absolutely. Well, let's have a, we've been talking about the show. Some people may have missed it in all its pristine excellence. So let's have a look at a clip. This is a clip from uh, from Jeeves and Worcester. A poop, Jeeves. And what's more, a poop who drinks nothing stronger than orange juice. I was not aware of that, sir. Oh yes, Jeeves, I've had it from his own lips. Whether from some hereditary taint or because he promised his mother he wouldn't. Gussie Fingnottle has never pushed so much as the simplest gin and tonic over the larynx. And he expects, this poop expects, Jeeves, under these conditions, to propose marriage to the girl he loves. Well, uh, I mean, one uh, hardly knows whether to smile or weep. What? You consider total abstinence to be a handicap in a gentleman wishing to make a proposal of marriage, sir? Well, dash it, Jeeves, use your intelligence. Were it not for the juice of the grape and the grain, weddings would be a thing of the past. Proposals but a dim memory. Without it, Jeeves, we babble. <laughs> well, I thought you looked, uh, you looked terrific there, but um, Stephen well, just looked like a tall, dark Johnny to me. He, he did, really did yeah. It, yeah. Uh, now, at the moment, we're almost overrun with double acts. You've got your French and Saunders, or even Saunders, there's Hale and Pace, Smith mm. and Jones, of course, Fry and Lloyd. Why, of do, course. why do you think it's almost like a return to traditional comedy, it seems to me? Well, I don't know. It's an, it's an extraordinary boom. Um, I, I sometimes think that really that comedy, I mean, it, is, it is, feels to me rather like the situation with house prices about ten years ago, you know, that all these all these double acts are sitting around rather like a state agent. In fact, they quite sound like a state agent. In fact, Fry and Laurie could be an estate agent, you know, and we're twanging our braces and going, oh, the market's pretty strong at the moment, actually, yeah. Um, and, uh, the one, you know, pretty soon it's all going to crash, and quite rightly so. I think we've had enough, haven't we? Well, enough, enough comedy or enough estate agents? Oh, enough agents. comedy. Well, no, we well, estate agents. No, we have to feel sorry for them. But you've now. artfully combined the two with your estate agent commercials, of course. So uh, oh, well, nice of you to bring those up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't go on. Well, no, 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 right. uh, as 
commercials go, they're marvellous. Oh, well, that's is. very good of you to Which say. Which is down by Faithways. They're, they're, they're short. Nice and short. Yeah. How, did, how did you and Stephen actually get together? I know you were at Cambridge, but, I mean, why did you become a partnership? Did your eyes meet across a crowded... It was exactly that. Something? It was exactly that. We didn't speak for the first week or so. Uh, <laughs> it was just one motel room to another. Um, <laughs> you know, it was a heady days, Jonathan. Heady days. Somehow language didn't seem to be important then. Uh, <laughs> You know, you'll find other means of expression. I, um... Just touching? Yes. <laughs> uh, no, has that... <laughs> well, you've got to keep your eye on those tall, dark johnnies. Yeah, you? yeah. <laughs> um, well, well, let's talk about Stephen Little Law. That obviously is a big part of your life. What, what would his best and his worst points be? Um, oh, well, his best points are just too numerous to mention. I mean, he's... He's... <laughs> he's, he's, uh, oh, what are they? he's... No, he's, he's tall. Very tall, dark. Um, no, he's a, he's a fantastic chap. I mean, and it's a great, it's an honour and a thrill to, to work with him, you know, because he's um, he's bright and I mean immensely bright. I mean, in fact, sometimes nauseatingly bright. Um, generous and good company, and it's it's great fun. It really is. Look, let me ask you about what you're up to at the moment, because you're actually not working with him all the time. Um, no, no. At the moment, you're just about to branch out. You're, you're appearing in a play now. I, I am not. Well, not yet. We've got soon. about uh, we've got about ten days to go, and I my watch tells the date. Um, and <laughs> we've got about uh, about ten days to go, and uh, it's getting a bit scary now. I must admit. Have you actually done much theatre? No, no, no theatre at all. No, 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 I've never I've never done any theatre at all. So uh, it must be it must be a nerve wracking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're making we're making. I spend about 18 hours of every day in the lavatory at the moment, yes, <laughs> that's true. And, but, but then, actually, it's not just me, because, because Ben Elton, who wrote, the, who wrote the play called Gasping, um, has, has, has not written a West End play before, and the producer's not produced one before, and the director's not directed one before. That's a very solid basis to it build is, upon, isn't, there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we've got naivety and freshness on our side. So at the moment, though, I mean, it's especially, I don't want to make you feel even more uh, worried and frightened, but it's especially dangerous time to open. The critics seem so savage. I know. They, it's, they, they've been closing things left, right and centre. I mean, I, they have turned into, really, the sort of the Japanese whaling fleet, you know, that they, <laughs> they will go on and on and on until the species is extinct. And then, then they'll have no jobs. Ha, 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 ha. But it is, they have been, I just hope that by the time they get to us, they will have been so gorged on the blood of their victims that they won't, they will, they will leave us alone. I mean, I hope, I hope so, because I think it is, it really is a very funny play. I mean, it's a, it is great fun to do. So what's it about? I know it's, it's another kind of ecology-based uh, idea. Uh, sort of, yeah. That makes it sound pretty dull, um, if you don't mind me saying it does. No, no please, no, no, excuse no. me of dullness whenever you do <laughs> no, no. Especially it's, on a live show, please. It's, uh, <laughs> it's about, uh, um, <laughs> It's so about... that, that must be the look you gave Stephen when you first met him. That's right. That's Suddenly right. language yeah. flew you, out the window, you didn't felt it? it didn't <laughs> um, no, it's about a huge multinational company run by um, a character played by Bernard Hill who goes a bit mad. And he gets bored with making money so easily. Money is too easy for him. So he's looking for another way of making money. And uh, I, as the thrusting young Turk of the organisation, <laughs> come up with the idea of, of basically selling designer air. Um, it's all it's all really about the ownership of air, you know, that air will be will be sucked off the north face of Mount Etna and blown into a wine bar in Fulham, you know, and, and people will be going, oh, it's great stuff, actually. It will. You know, it's that, and, and it's what happens to the world. Um, and it, it takes over the world. It, it is a Frankenstein I've created, and uh, the world is thrown into crisis. Uh, yeah, uh, which, but it is a comedy. God, blimey, I mean, it does sound a bit... Well, dark, I was going to say, inherently, it's not a funny idea. It, it, well, no, it is a bit grim. But, um, Are you sure it's meant to be a comedy? Are you sure you haven't been old, playing it the wrong way for the last uh, few weeks? <laughs> well, I hope somebody's going to tell... I mean, ten days to go, someone's going to tell me <laughs> soon, isn't they? I, I, well, no, it is very, very funny. A lot of jokes. Well, Ben does know how to write a joke, so he does. Sure I, I, he's done it. He's done it a few times. Yeah. Now, now not many people realise, or I hope not many people realise, because we have a small surprise plan that your first TV appearance wasn't uh, as part of that comedic duo, or wasn't anything to do with comedy necessarily. It was something else altogether. Have a look at this clip of Hugh's first television appearance. Rowing four, Hugh Laurie, one of the Etonians in the boat. He's twenty. Cambridge are very strong finishers. These men from the camp have a lot of strength behind them. Cambridge are catching them, and Cambridge are almost level as we come to the close of this extraordinary boat race. And they're level. Cambridge are level. We haven't seen a crew come from behind, not in my memory, certainly. And it looks as though Oxford have just made it. Just picked on the post there.
I think uh, buy a canvas is the term, isn't it? Well, that's, that's fine, because as I remembered it, we won it, but it's very hard. <laughs> it's as you've been telling people ever since. I have, years I have. After, it's yeah. a bit embarrassing to have that thrown in your face. So you know? was that why you went to Cambridge? Were you more interested in the sport or the performance? It, well, no, it was. That was, in, I'm afraid to say, entirely why I went to, to Cambridge, yeah. Um, and you got lured as well, seduced by Stephen into the world of comedy. That's right. Seduced is the word. And um, <laughs> don't use it again. Um, but, uh, and uh, that, that's right, yeah, yeah. So what do you think you would have done otherwise? What would you, if you hadn't gone into comedy? Um, I, I'd rather have this idea about, well, a cafe on the A1, I think, is... Um, sounds good. Uh, don't ever set your sights too high. No, no, quite. <laughs> that's the thing. Well, well, listen, it's a pleasure having you on. Good luck with gasping. Well, thanks very much. I think it's going to be a cracker. Stay with us, because we've got some guests who I want you I to meet. I will indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Hugh Lowy. That was Hugh Laurie, and incidentally, the Jeeves and Worcester series is being packaged up and sold to the States, but under a new title that's more in keeping with meaningful American sensibilities. The neighbours wake the dog up and give him a beer and get ready for once-in-the-lifetime televisual treat. Live together for the first and almost definitely the last time. <laughs> <laughs> Hugh Laurie, Patrick Moore and Phoebe Legere. <laughs> Patrick still doesn't know what's hit him, do you, Patrick? Thank you very much for that. I'll tell you what, this is, you're going to say in the morning, did it happen or was it a dream? <laughs> this is what television's all about. It doesn't come any better than this. What can I say, ladies and gentlemen, to encapsulate my feelings about the emotional stopover I've made here these last two weeks at the weird and way out world of Wogan? I could say thanks to each and every and all of my guests, including the ones who got up and mooched out halfway through my questions. I could become moist around the retina about the sumptuous quality of the backstage team. I might even risk infection and shake the hands of Harry Stoneham and his boys, but I haven't finished with these cufflinks yet. I really should thank you, the audience and viewers, for making me, a simple East End lad, television magnate and sterling billionaire, so very welcome. But I'm sure all that gets taken as well. Instead, let me speak from the heart and pay tribute to a man who, well, I guess you could say without this man, I simply wouldn't be where I am tonight. His name is John Hannon, and he's my minicab driver, and he gets the hump if I've been waiting too long. So until next time, this has been Jonathan Ross saying, hey there, Mr. Wogan, it's a piece of cake. Thanks for watching. Good night.